This is a cautionary tale about benchmarks, JavaScript runtimes, and building stuff from scratch. If you're even remotely connected to the web dev world, then you've heard of Node, the JavaScript runtime that allows you to run JavaScript on the server. Regardless of your opinions on the language or the technology, there's no denying its popularity. But now it seems every month there's a new JavaScript runtime that promises to be faster, better, and healthier than all of its predecessors. But JavaScript also got way faster thanks to a new Swiss Army knife called Bun. From Node to Dino to Bun to Hermes to Static Hermes. JS, the fastest JavaScript. Damn, they actually went for the fastest. Yes, we have yet another JavaScript runtime. So let's deep dive into the weeds to build our own from scratch to see how they really work. To start with, let's look at the latest offering, which is what got me started on this whole journey. Winter.js is a blazingly fast JavaScript server that runs service worker scripts according to the Winter Community Group specification. So let's just take a step back and survey our surroundings before we dive deep into any code. WinterCG are a group of organizations trying to standardize JavaScript runtimes by providing a common minimum API. The idea being that if you code against this API, then your code should work on any of these compliant runtimes, which makes it easier to move between them. Now, I'm all for open standards, and competition is always good, so I'm 100% on board so far. And WinterJS is fully compliant with the WinterCG spec, apart from the places it isn't. Now this is an impressive bit of kit, written in Rust and using SpiderMonkey, Mozilla's JavaScript engine, so I'm in no way belittling the amount of effort that's gone into this, but I am a little skeptical of the benchmarks. Can run 100,000 requests a second on a single laptop. Now, I'm assuming that's good. I mean, it's a big number, but I'm not a web dev, so I've got no basis for comparison. So digging deeper, the benchmarks were run on a MacBook Pro M3 Max, which is all well and good, but how representative is that of a real world scenario? Like when I go to deploy something on AWS or Azure, is a MacBook Pro a deployment target? I mean, I actually have no idea, but I just assumed all these things were deployed on Linux. Okay, so now we've got some comparisons against other runtimes, which does show WinterJS is faster. But again, their test case is super simple. It just returns a 200 response with hello text, and it's all done on localhost. My personal opinion is that the only benchmarks you should trust are the ones that you have run on your production environment. And even then, you should try and get someone else to verify it. Anyway, let's get started. These runtimes tend to use system languages such as Rust and Zig as their main workhorse. So I'll be using another boutique language, C++. This up and coming language is receiving regular updates and it's already up to version 23. We're going to do this in layers, specifically three layers. But before we start, we need a name, something that encapsulates the magnitude of the work that we're trying to do. So I've opted for best JS in the hope that it's somehow better than all the other JS. So the first layer is IO and events. Now, if you've used Node before, you'll be aware of its async model. The idea being that you can do other work whilst you're waiting for long running IO tasks to complete. So we need to create this system first, something that allows us to submit asynchronous work to the kernel. We could use libuv like Node does, but again, let's do it ourselves. There's a variety of ways to do this, such as select and poll, but the more modern way is using io uring. This essentially creates two circular buffers that your process shares with the kernel. You put requests into one, and the kernel puts results into the other. This provides an efficient way to submit work to the kernel and wait for the results. And I've knocked up a little example which allows you to add a request to accept a socket connection and then wait for a client to connect. This isn't very asynchronous at the moment. We're not doing anything whilst we're waiting for clients to connect, and when they do eventually connect, we're not doing anything with them. So let's build out our server a little bit and make it a bit more flexible. And for that, we need layer two, coroutines. For anyone unaware of what a coroutine is, you can think of it like this. A regular function has a predefined start and end point, and it will run from the start to the end. A coroutine, on the other hand, can be paused and resumed from anywhere within the function. This functionality makes them great for handling async code. You can suspend the coroutine whilst you're waiting for the kernel to do something for you, such as accept a new request, and then you can resume it once that request has been fulfilled. Now, if you ever use coroutines in Python or C Sharp, they're relatively easy to use. You sprinkle in some async and await calls, and the language just takes care of the rest. Now, in C++, things are not so easy. Coroutines are usually implemented as state machines. This allows the language to decide how to transition between the various states throughout the coroutine's lifetime. Most languages pick a sensible state machine design for you, and therefore it's not something you even have to worry about. In C++ land, you must provide all the details of how the state machine works yourself. 
So simply calling cur await will make your compiler very unhappy. So instead you need to return an object, but not just any object, one with an internal struct called promise type, and it has to be spelled exactly like this. You then use that struct to define what happens when the coroutine starts, when it finishes, what to return to the caller, and how to handle exceptions. And that's not even covering the optional dynamic allocation customization points. And the thing you want to await on gets even weirder. You have to declare an internal struct within the function, pass yourself in, and then use that to define how the various points of awaiting shall work. So like all things C++, there's a lot of control, but it's also a lot of work. However, we are left with quite a nice solution, which allows us to await for a new connection, and then await to read from that, and then await to write a response. However, there's a little more here than meets the eye. C++ does not actually provide you with an event loop, or in fact any means of executing and waiting for tasks. So I've blended in our IO URing code to create a custom event loop, and I think it's quite nice. You add a request, say accept, recv or send. This then queues it up with the IO URing, and then our main event loop just waits for responses. And when it gets one, it resumes the coroutine that started it. So in this sense, while we're waiting for the kernel to perform a recv or send, we can still accept new incoming connections without blocking, all in a single thread. Speaking of threads, I've modified the code to respond with a proper HTTP response, as well as added a couple of worker threads, each of these with their own IO URing event loop. And now, if we use the same benchmark tool as Winter.js, we can see we absolutely smash their 100,000 requests a second. However, this is totally meaningless, as the code just serves a single response. It does not, and cannot, do anything else. But, in this specific example, it is fast. However, the modern discerning developer doesn't want to write all this C++ chuff. What they really want to do is write JavaScript. Specifically, this JavaScript. So let's look at the final layer, JavaScript. Let's bring in a JS engine so that all this async nonsense is driven by a script. There's three main choices for JavaScript engines at the moment. Chrome's V8, WebKit's JavaScript Core, and Mozilla's SpiderMonkey. I've gone with V8 as it's just the first one I actually managed to build. Now V8 is a complex bit of software, and I've done my best to follow the best practices, but it's definitely not as efficient as it could be. We read in the script file, asynchronously of course, we register some global functions that the JavaScript will call, but is backed by some C++. We then do this horror to make sure that calling add event listener with fetch kicks off the socket coroutines. And then we make sure we grab this string and pass it back to the C++ to send to the client. Now this is not the most optimal design, and it is inherently single-threaded, so we do pay a performance cost for this. But it's a small price to pay to be able to write our server in JavaScript. Anyway, we've gone from queuing up async calls to the kernel, to a C++ coroutine abstraction, all the way up to driving the whole thing via JavaScript. However, there's one final step. All JavaScript runtimes need a logo. Let's try with AI. I think a climber overcoming a mountain is fitting representation for what we've done. A whimsical cartoon representation of a mountain climber triumphantly reaching the summit against all the odds. Like George Mallory if he hadn't died. In their eye is an opalescent gleam, like a shepherd discovering their lost flock. <laughs> okay, maybe just a trophy with a smiley face. We're now ready to launch version 1.0. But the fun doesn't end here. For more low-level shenanigans, check out this next video.